Hello, America. Hello, Alaska. This is Stand, a show making courage contagious by inspiring Americans to boldly stand for freedom, truth, and government by the people. I'm your host, Kelly Chavaca, a former government watchdog and candidate for U.S. Senate in Alaska. I'm joined by my amazing co-host and husband, Nikki Chavaca, who used to work for the Department of Justice. You can join our community of standouts and watch all of our episodes and subscribe by checking out our website, standshow.org. That's where all of our podcast platforms are and our social media channels, standshow.org. Well, today we have an inspiring guest with us, Matt Staver. Nikki and I had the pleasure of meeting Matt when we were in law school together and getting to watch his epic legal career since then. Matt's been on the front lines of fighting for Americans' constitutional rights and civil liberties. He's actually argued three cases before the U.S. Supreme Court and multiple cases before federal and state courts. He served as the dean of the university's law school over at Liberty University and written numerous books and articles. He's the host and producer of Faith and Freedom's podcast and radio show and also Freedom's Call radio program. So we're truly honored to have Matt on the show today to talk about all the work he's currently doing at Liberty Council and all the courageous clients that they represent. If you want to support the work that they're doing at Liberty Council and help Matt Staver out, you can go to lc.org. Matt, thank you so much for all that you're doing for Americans and welcome to STAND. Well, thank you, uh, Kelly and Nikki. It's just been uh, great to watch you as well. And uh, seeing you when you both were in law school, it was a great privilege and honor to be able to meet you there and then see your careers and what you're doing, not only in Alaska, but around the country. So it's an honor to be with you. Well, we're excited to see you again. None of us look any different <laughs> all those decades ago. Well, Matt, you've, I mean, you've had a truly impressive career defending and protecting people's constitutional rights, often at great personal cost. Uh, but you didn't start off saying to yourself, I want to be a civil liberties litigator. What inspired you to go from, you know, a comfortable anonymous life where, I mean, you could have made a great deal of money in private practice to actually being on the front lines of defending free speech and religious liberty? Well, it actually started even before law school. I was a pastor and it was 1983 and there were two people in Kentucky, a Roman Catholic and a Protestant. They wanted to reach out to pastors about abortion. It was a subject matter that I had no knowledge about. I knew a lot about the Bible, original languages, history and so forth. Graduated number one in my seminary class but I didn't know about the most important cultural issue in my backyard. And so it was a documentary called Assignment Life. And that documentary showed a first trimester abortion uh, in process. And it showed the assembly of the baby body parts. And that was what hit me that what we're talking about is not what I thought from the media, that this is a real human being. And of course, it talked about the United States Supreme Court. It was that process that led me into law school. And then after law school, I worked for a firm in Orlando, Florida. Could have gone on to, and in fact, did have my own firm after that. And you're right, you know, there's uh, careers that you choose. And I could have gone on and made a lot of money. Uh, but what good was that uh, when I'm just making somebody money or making somebody less money, you know, just changing money from hand to hand from one defendant mm -hmm. or plaintiff to another? But what lasting legacy am I leaving? And so it was because of that, I dedicated my life to advancing religious freedom, the sanctity of human life, and God's design for marriage and family. That's, mm. that's an amazing story. And you know, I, I think about how when it comes to money and our possessions, we can't take them with us, right? But right. we can leave, like you said, a legacy. And uh, that's, that's an amazing story of being willing to sacrifice to leave that legacy. And I'm thinking also about your clients because they're part of the mm -hmm. battle as well. And these are everyday Americans, right, who are standing up, often at great cost to themselves, for religious freedom, for freedom of speech. And some people might think, hey, they're they're just trying to protect their own rights, but actually they're they're fighting to protect all of our rights. And so they're looking to leave a legacy that's positive and impactful for all of us. I was wondering if you could tell us maybe a one or two stories about 
what standing for freedom of speech and the free exercise of religion has cost you uh, and your clients? Well, as it relates to us personally, my wife and I, and those that uh, are in this work, uh, it costs a lot. Um, you know, nobody likes to be thought badly or had bad things or lies told about them. And that's the nature when you're dealing with abortion or the LGBTQ agenda, those two, it is a very vicious culture clash that takes place. And there are people uh, that though we love them on the other side of these issues, uh, they literally not just want to destroy your reputation, frankly, they wanna kill you. There are people that want to eliminate you. So we have to take a lot of extra security precautions. We have security cameras all over our facilities and at our home, and we do active shooter training uh, with our staff. You know, most of our staff are armed uh, just in case of those kinds of situations, God forbid. Uh, but we take security precautions. However, you know, that, that doesn't change a thing that we do other than be aware of our surroundings. For our clients, you know, they they sacrifice everything. There are clients, for example, in the military, a uh, commander of a Navy surface warship, and he says, I'm not going to take the COVID shots because of religious reasons, because of the aborted fetal cells. And he put his entire career on the line. He's an individual that is just incredibly inspiring and so many others uh, like these individuals that we have met uh, in the military of all branches are so inspiring. They put their entire careers on the line. These are some people that had 19 and a half years in the military and they only needed wow. six months or less to reach their 20 year retirement. And they were willing to put it all on the line and some of them frankly did. There's others that we represent like Kim Davis, the case is still going on from 2015. She's the Kentucky clerk who says, I can't put my name and authority on a marriage that God didn't design and create and sanction. And so as a result, that case is still going on. Uh, we may end up back at the US Supreme Court with the Kim Davis case. But what's inspiring is that there are people who don't go out looking for a fight. They're not causing trouble. Many of them are not activists politically per se. But when the controversy comes knocking on their door, uh, they press into God and they have a stronger relationship because of the adversity that comes against them. And they take a stand and they end up changing future history. Hmm. That's a good way to say it, Matt. You're describing ordinary Americans who have a conflict that comes their way. And in the face of that, they demonstrate extraordinary courage. And these are really big costs. You're talking about retirement, um, put your life is at risk, your finances are at risk, your reputation, friends, family. But what makes that cost worth it? What are some of the things that you've seen being on the front lines for all these years that you go, you know, this is why we get up every morning or this is why we do it? You know, just uh, as an example, um, when we were in the height of some of these mandates, we did regular calls all the time, conference calls, multiple conference calls every week. And we had people uh, on those calls crying, uh, just weeping because they knew that uh, they had somebody that was standing with them and that they were able to just have counsel, not just legal counsel, but spiritual counsel as well. Transformative lives. I mean, we've seen their their faith grow. We've seen, as a result uh, of their stand, other people come to the Lord because they see Jesus in their actions, and they are transform, trans, you know, transformed in, in, in all that they do. Um, it's an incredible experience. I would not trade that for millions and millions of dollars in the bank account. That's a temporary, as you mentioned, Nikki. You know, that, that's temporary, and that comes and goes. But this is a legacy. The legacy that we leave is not so much what we do, it's the people we leave that we touch, that we help. And that legacy has a ripple effect, like throwing a pebble in a, a pond. It literally has a ripple effect that goes on uh, and echoes into eternity. Mm -hmm. There's a Bible verse that says, the Lord is with you like a dread champion. And yeah. <laughs> I, I think a lot of times in the pictures we see, of Jesus painted, he's 
this subdued character with children, and we don't often think about how um, the Lord is is like this guy in your corner when you need backup and you need a heavy. Um, we need that person to come in and have our back. And it sounds like that's what you're describing is this benefit of creating a community of courageous people who can stand together. And there are times you're going to get knocked down, but together when you stand, you're just stronger. And having those people in that community to build you up is really important. Absolutely. Let me give you a quick example, if I might. Um, you know, in the case that we won last year, 2022, 9-0 to zero at the Supreme Court, Shirtliff versus City of Boston, Hal Shirtliff is the founder of Camp Constitution, and all he wanted to do with that is to train young people in the Constitution and the founding principles of the, the rule of law. So he wanted to do this in Boston, and he applied to have a flag flown for about an hour during his event in which it would highlight the Judeo-Christian heritage and history of Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They had 284 flags that they had approved over 12 years, not a single denial, pro-communist, anti-communist. They had all kinds of different viewpoints. They told him uh, that you can fly the flag, but you got to change one word on the application. Don't call it Christian. Call it something that's non-religious. The flag's okay. What's the problem is your perception of the flag. If you consider the flag to be religious or Christian, you can't fly it. If you will change it to a non-religious modifier, can't constitution flag anything but Christian, you can fly it. Hal said no. And uh, we thought that that would be a no-brainer case. Uh, we lost at the Court of Appeals twice, mm -hmm. three to zero, and then one nine to zero at the U.S. Supreme Court. That wow. particular case, May the 2nd, ultimately rejected the Lemon Test of 1971. That wow. also became the foundation for the Coach Kennedy case uh, later in June that also rejected the Lemon Test. As a result of those two cases, what we began when we founded Liberty Council in 1989 as a mission among many to overturn the Lemon versus Kurtzman case that wreaked damage to the First Amendment, that became a reality decades later in 2022 with this case. So what was intended for evil or ill to Hal Shirtliff and to censor, God turned around for good. Hal had a choice. He could have walked away and we would never have this precedent and Lemon would still be standing. But Hal decided to take a stand and we were there to help him. And as a result, decades in the making, Lemon has been overturned and that will have generational impact. We'll be back with more inspiring stories with Matt Staver after this. Stand by. Weka Tactical specializes in combat effective weapon systems and prides themselves on the best prices in the state of Alaska. Weka Tactical sells firearms, ammunition, gear, body armor, night vision, and much more. They offer a price match guarantee, as well as a discount to all first responders. Visit Weka Tactical at 5630 B Street in Anchorage. Weka Tactical, Alaska's premier store for combat effective weapon systems. Welcome back to Stan. Today we're standing with Matt Staver, the founder and chairman of Liberty Council. You can learn more about their critical work and help them out at lc.org. Matt, I want to pick up on what we were just talking about, this important case that came out of the Supreme Court that you were talking, Shirtliff versus Boston, and the overturn of the lemon test. Now, Nikki and I are totally tracking with you and geeking out on this. But imagine there's some people who wonder if we're talking about dessert <laughs> and what is this lemon test and why is it so important to Americans? Could you just talk to us a little bit about why that was so critical for Liberty Council to overturn for all these years and what it means for the average person that's listening right now? Certainly, the lemon test came from a case in 1971 at the Supreme Court called Lemon versus Kurtzman, and it distorted the First Amendment Establishment Clause, ultimately affecting the Free Exercise Clause and the Free Speech Clause. It was used as a wrecking ball, for example, to remove Ten Commandments, nativity scenes, stars of David, crosses, other religious symbols. And in the Coach Kennedy case, just as an example, like in the Shirtliff case, if your perception was religious— or Christian, 
you couldn't have equal access in a public facility, public square. So Coach Kennedy could kneel down and he could think secular thoughts. If that's what he wanted to think, that's fine. He could be uh, opposing the national anthem. That's okay. He could be thinking about where he's going to order the pizza for the gang after the game. That's fine. But if he thought about prayer silently, that's not okay under Lemon. If Hal Shirtliff wanted to raise the flag, flag's okay as long as you deem it to be secular. But if you deem it to be religious, it's not. And that was Lemon. Lemon was overturned. So there is a whole new day ahead of us as a result of Lemon. In fact, not only was Lemon overturned in the 1970s uh, with the 2022 cases, but between 2022 and 2023, Lemon was overturned, 1971. Roe versus Wade, 1973, abortion was overturned. The TWA case, 1977, that uh, really gutted religious protection in the workplace, that was overturned as well. And then the 1978 case, affirmative action in college admissions, that also has been overturned. 14 months of overturning the 1970s activist court uh, from that era 50 years ago. And it will have huge impact in so many different ways uh, going forward. Yeah, what you just outlined for us is in the last 50 years, of people taking cases up and standing strong and facing defeat. I mean, yeah. we've heard all these cases go forward where it's been no or no cert has been granted or they've lost at lower courts and they've had to take their licking. You've been taking these cases up at state court and federal court and many others that we've read about in articles. 50 years later, it's a whole generation later, all of yeah. a sudden, victory, 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 victory. And the original meaning, the original intent of the Constitution is now being preserved and handed down. That's huge. And I think for those of us who are listening right now and wondering, do I get in this battle again? Do I keep fighting? Um, what you just outlined is so encouraging for everybody about why we take a stand, why we stand up for our convictions and values, why it's worth it. Because... It's not about if you're going to get knocked down. It's about who can get back up again and stay in the fight because the fight is worth fighting. Some causes are so noble that their um, their nobility is even worthy in the defeat. You keep fighting, having your, your hope set on the future. Absolutely. And, and an example of that is in 1992. Uh, there was a case at the U.S. Supreme Court. We filed an amicus brief on it. It was graduation prayer. We thought that mm -hmm. the court should hold it. It was an, a very short prayer. I think it was given by a rabbi. And the Supreme Court ultimately struck it down. Uh, we filed a brief asking the court to overturn Lemon. This was 1992. Uh, I was depressed for about two days after that. And then I said, you know what? This was just a temporary defeat. We need to regroup and figure out how to attack this and move forward and set precedent. Mm. And we moved forward with student-initiated graduation prayer, viewpoint discrimination, and those things eventually made their way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now the lemon test is gone. Uh, so it taught me a lesson back in 1992. I don't ever get discouraged from these defeats, and I encourage people not to get discouraged, not to give up when you get defeated. It's a temporary setback. You've got to regroup. And the real issue is not whether you're going to get knocked down. You will get knocked down. <laughs> That's <laughs> the right. The question is, will you get back up? Yeah. And when you get back up, you have to keep on getting back up and press forward. And I think when we look at history, particularly biblical history, it gives us that encouragement that no matter how bad things are, whether it was the Jews during the time of the uh, Exodus or Esther during Persia or whatever it might be, uh, God ultimately prevailed against the impossible. Hmm. Let's jump off on this theme that you're talking about in history, because you are quite the student of history. But we're in some difficult times right now, and it can be challenging to contextualize this increasing trend towards censorship, the weaponization of government, especially against people who have certain ideas, hyper-partisanship. Uh, when you look back and the understanding of history that you have, how does your perspective on history shape your understanding of current events that we're experiencing now? Well, we're living in a very significant time of challenges to so many things, as you mentioned. And I look at it both from a historical standpoint and a short term, but also from a particularly a long term perspective. 
and put myself, for example, if I were uh, the Jews uh, in Egypt and I were having to go out and labor every day and see people abused and beaten and cry out to God and ask, you know, why are we not being delivered? You know, when you're living in that moment, it's hard to see beyond those circumstances. But now we know it's in those difficult times with people like Moses and others that made difficult decisions, put everything on the line. And when they were willing to put everything on the line, where there was uh, no safety net, where it was a point of no return, God used those people. And those are the things that change history. The same thing with Esther. She put everything on the line. Mm. If she had not, we would never know who Esther was. You know, we look at uh, the three Hebrews that were thrown in the fiery furnace. They were trusting in God, but they were willing literally to give everything up, including their lives. And if they just decided to compromise and say, you know what, in my mind, I'll, I'll curse this statute and I'll pray to God, but I'll bow down just so that it looks okay for everyone else so that my head's not chopped off. I'm not thrown into the fiery furnace. They could have done that. It would be easy, very easy to compromise. They said no. When others bowed, they stood and they were thrown in the fiery furnace. It's those things that change history, and it's those things that ultimately echo through history. So when I look at those kinds of things, much worse than what we're experiencing now, I know with God all things are possible, and what is intended for evil, God can turn around for good. And the real difference between that and status quo is one person or group of people willing to stand for God and put everything on the line where there's no safety net, and God will do incredible, mighty works that will change history and that will echo, as I say, through through the ages to come. That's a really powerful point, Matt. And I was just thinking about when you talk about putting it all on the line, you know, our founders in the Declaration of Independence were willing yeah. to sacrifice their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Yeah, right. And it was only because they were willing to do that that we enjoy the freedoms that we we have today. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm just thinking about, so something George Washington said, uh, a quote on, on freedom of speech. He said that if the freedom of speech is taken away, then dumb and silent, we may be mm -hmm. led like sheep to the slaughter. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not just true of freedom of speech, it's true of uh, the free exercise of religion. The two are intricately intertwined because they both go to conscience and, and expression of your, your thoughts and your viewpoints. You said something very powerful earlier where you said that you don't hate your legal opponents. And I think that's so important for people to understand that when you and your clients are standing for your convictions and beliefs and our views about the Constitution, which stem from originalism, it's not just for your client's sake, it's actually even for the sake of your opponents, ironically. And what motivates you isn't hate, it's actually uh, love. So a question for you, what do you think the next legal battles will be in your ongoing uh, fight to protect freedom of speech and free exercise of religion? And how do you do that in a way that communicates to those who oppose you that your motivation isn't hatred or bigotry or disgust mm -hmm. or judgment or condemnation. It is actually love. Yeah. Well, those are good questions. Uh, I think in the area of life, obviously we won a huge battle at the U.S. Supreme Court with the overturning of Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. But that now moves the battle back down to the level of the people, members of Congress and the state legislatures. And so that battle is very, very intense. And the uh, history is unwritten yet. It's being written as we speak as to which states are going to protect the sanctity of human life, the most vulnerable among us, or are not going to protect the sanctity of human life. So that's a huge battle that is moving forward right now. Uh, that's not only here in the United States, but it's also on a global level with the World Health Organization and other things that are taking place on a global scale. With respect to the clash between religious freedom and anything related to LGBTQ, that is a big issue uh, that we're in the midst of. A big case was, was won just recently at the uh, Supreme Court, but there are many others that are coming down the, the line. 
And the abolition of gender is part of that. And we're starting to see unbelievable kinds of stories come out from children and parents in the public schools and other venues where they're being really indoctrinated into a very dangerous idea. Uh, and they're actually being, in many cases, misdiagnosed uh, with regards to different issues that they might have, whether they're on the autism spectrum or have other stressors in their lives and they're being pushed. Instead of getting proper treatment and therapy, they're getting pushed down a road of transgenderism and puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and other kinds of surgical interventions, which are very uh, dangerous and damaging. So those kinds of things, I think, will continue to move forward. You know, when you talk about these kinds of things, both from a spiritual, constitutional, or from a rational perspective, no matter how much, and we try to do that as much as possible, that you convey to people that just because I'm on a different side of this issue than you are doesn't mean that I hate you. In fact, that would be contrary to who we are, be contrary to our following our Lord Jesus Christ, who loves everyone and, and respects, you know, we respect the human dignity of every person. But no matter how much you say that, I think it is kind of like a straw man argument. Somebody, instead of being able to attack or deal with the merits of your argument, they paint you in a certain way or paint the argument in a certain way, and then they attack that. So they attack you as a person, and they try to misrepresent you as a person and call you a hater or a hate group and so forth of that nature. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Uh, I think we can't in kind respond. We just have to continue to uh, argue the principles, argue what's right, and do it so in love. That's really nice. I think the problem that you have, though, is that in, when you get into this area, uh, particularly with politicians that are not prepared for this. They get into this area and they make a statement. They're not prepared for this overwhelming avalanche of hostility that comes against them. And instead of staying true to their principles, they either change or they remain silent. And that's not an option. All right. When we uh, come back with civil liberties litigator Matt Staver, I'd like to ask you, Matt, for some practical advice you could give our audience on how they can stand in their spheres of influence and communities for what they believe. We'll be right back on Stand. Stand by. Welcome back to Stand, everybody. Uh, we're talking with Matt Staver of Liberty Council. Matt, every generation of Americans has a sacred duty to defend and protect our Constitution. Every generation has a responsibility to pass on to the next the freedoms that they've enjoyed. You and your team at Liberty Council have, have answered that call. You guys are all in. I'm wondering, though, what are some of the ways our listeners could answer that that particular call too. Specifically, I'm thinking about how can they stand for freedom of speech, for free exercise of religion in their spheres of influence and in their communities? What are some practical things they can do? I think the first thing is to understand your identity. Um, so many people don't know who they are. They search for their identity in different places. And my identity is solidly grounded in Jesus Christ. So that's where my identity is centered. And consequently, it's from that particular identity and that relationship that everything else springs forth. Truth is always truth, and it's never going to change throughout uh, eons of the ages. So don't be afraid of speaking the truth, even when the populace goes the other way. You know, the eugenic movement uh, back in the 1920s, all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court was pervasive in every field. Uh, but there were some dissenting voices. Bonhoeffer was a dissenting voice among the Nazi Germany time, even among religious leaders. And I think like Bonhoeffer, one of the things that impressed me about his life is that he made certain decisions along the way. You ask yourself, how can he come to a point where he is hung, you know, just two weeks or so before Nazism falls and he's steadfast in, in his actions. 
Well, he didn't just all of a sudden wake up one day and become that uh, strong and bold. It was things along the way, decisions and stands along the way that ultimately God prepared him for the next challenge in his life. So I would say for uh, your viewers and listeners, number one, press into the Lord. Number two, be aware of your surroundings. I was totally unaware of abortion back in 1983, yet I knew the scriptures a lot. I knew the languages, but I was unaware of the issues in my community, life and death that was taking place by these clinics. Every time I drive by, get uh, educated, become aware, and then ask the Lord, how can he use you? And he's going to use you one step at a time. And every time he uses you, he's going to prepare you for something even greater so that when even greater challenges come, you'll be prepared to make those decisions and make those stands. That's great. You referred to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he's one of my personal heroes, a theologian, a pastor, an academic, and a spy. <laughs> and he was spying on, on, on Hitler um, and standing against the Nazis. And like you said, he, he sacrificed everything for that. I, I really appreciate how you, you phrased all of that for people of, people of faith. Could you also talk about from a perspective, if, for example, a member of our audience isn't necessarily religious, what would you say to them about how they could stand? Practically speaking. Well, I think, you know, you said it, uh, Nikki, that we are blessed to live in this country. Uh, so many men and women gave their lives, shed their blood, put everything on the line to give us freedom. There are so many places around the world right now that have no freedom. They don't have freedom of speech. Um, they're coerced by the government. Uh, they're censored uh, much more than anything that we could ever imagine. We are born, we live in, or we are part of this nation that is a land of freedom that gives us incredible opportunity. And that is a, a gift and it's a, it's a obligation for us to pass on, to maintain the torch of liberty, but to pass it on to, to the next generation so that they can enjoy the kind of freedom that we enjoy. So it doesn't really matter what your worldview is in terms of religion. The fact is, I think there's always, uh, no matter what your faith is or whether you don't have any particular basis of faith, we all have this longing and desire to be free. That's an innate human uh, thing that we, we all share, no matter where we are, that we love freedom, we want to be free. And we have the obligation to be able to pass it on to future generations. And as Ronald Reagan says, it doesn't get passed on in your DNA. Each generation has to fight for it. Hmm. Well, Matt, I want to build on what you were saying, that you don't just wake up one day and become a brave constitutional rights and civil liberties activist like you. Um, what was one of your early stories about a major obstacle you faced and you really had to push through with perseverance and resilience? And how did you stay encouraged despite this big challenge. Could you share with us a story like that? Well, you know, when I was in high school, I was very quiet. I was very shy. I would walk down the hallway and <laughs> I would look at the tops of my shoes rather than, you know, people wow. faced it. The last thing I thought I was going to be doing is arguing in courts. And certainly I would never think I'd argue before the United States Supreme Court. But, you know, in giving my life to the Lord and then just taking those uh, challenges one little bite at a time, eventually the Lord prepared me for the things that I had no idea were in my future. I, I didn't know I would become dean of a law school and take a law school through all levels of accreditation. So it's just really uh, baby steps, if you will, uh, where the Lord prepares you uh, step by step to take you places where you didn't think you were going. In fact, uh, the Gospel of John, at the very end of the passage, uh, it's talking about Peter, and it says, you know, when you're we're young, you, you, you basically clothe yourself. When you get older, somebody else directs you. Mm. It's talking about how Peter was ultimately going to eventually give his life for the Lord that he betrayed. Uh, he wasn't quite prepared for that, but the Lord prepared him for that over time. So I would say to people, God has an incredible plan for each one of us, and he has a plan that's above and above beyond what you could ask, imagine, or think. And just take one step at a time, one day at a time, and he will reveal that plan to you as you move forward and do things beyond what you could possibly imagine. That's good. Now, you've given us a lot of wisdom and a lot of advice. 
and you've taken one step at a time, day by day, what's one of the accomplishments that you feel the most proud of? Well, I think uh, the, one of the most uh, important accomplishments is what happened in the last two years, overturning Roe v. Wade and overturning uh, the Lemon Test. Now we have to, now that we've gained that ground, we have to expand it and maintain the ground. And the other accomplishment is uh, launching a K-12 uh, Christian online academy to train a whole new generation of children from kindergarten up. And our vision is to move beyond kindergarten through 12th grade to college and university as well, to have this uh, incredible base of education because our educational system, as you know, is, is broken. It's certainly challenged and we can't keep on doing the same thing. So we have uh, been very blessed to work with so many good people and uh, we're very excited about one of the new ventures that we're doing with our Covenant Journey Academy, which is our K through 12 full service online uh, Christian based education. Wow, that's great. What can our audience do to support Liberty Council? They can go to Liberty Council's website. It's very simple. It's just lc.org, Liberty Council, lc.org. There's lots of information there. You can sign up for some of our emails that we send out on a regular basis. You can donate online as well and find other resources, lc.org. lc.org. And I was on your website earlier and preparing to talk with you and saw some of your amazing work that you're doing in the big cases. What's some of the big cases you'd like to highlight for us? Well, we just filed a petition to the Supreme Court uh, this week uh, with regards to healthcare workers out of Maine. And it's a big issue, a clash between uh, the federal law and state law. Uh, we have a petition that is pending there on Sandra Merritt, and she is the individual who was one of the undercover videographers regarding Planned Parenthood's baby body parts for sale scheme. Uh, that uh, could likely go to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's a huge issue uh, that is against Planned Parenthood pending before the U.S. Supreme Court. And that's just one of many, many cases that we're involved in. Yeah, it's interesting that instead of criminalizing the behavior of selling baby body parts, yeah. they criminalize the undercover investigative journalist. That's right. And if this case were to stand, it would literally uh, be a very big um, threat to any undercover journalist in the right. country. In fact, in, in California, we actually argued uh, just before this case, there was a PETA. In fact, PETA uh, filed an amicus brief in our support at the Court of Appeals because mm -hmm. they did undercover investigation of animal abuse sure. with the hidden cameras and so forth. And it ultimately changed the animal abuse that they were trying to uncover and expose. Uh, Kim Davis, or, I mean, uh, Sandra Merritt and David Delighton did the same thing with this unbelievable uh, undercover uh, documentary or video that was all done in public places where people were bragging about harvesting baby body parts and selling them for enormous amounts of profit. They should be behind bars. They should be punished. But in fact, what happened is the journalists are the ones uh, going to, to court. We have this case at the U.S. Supreme Court. It's a $16 million judgment in the lower court on behalf of Planned Parenthood against our clients, uh, which is outrageous. And then we're going to the criminal trial later uh, this fall wow. with regards to the same issue. All this started with Kamala Harris and then later Xavier Becerra, the, the then mm -hmm. attorney generals of California, now in the uh, Biden administration. Right. You know, that it, it's it's so tragic and sad to hear of people profiting off of the pain of mothers who've lost their children mm. and yeah. the, the children themselves. Matt, it's been so great to have you on the show. We really appreciate your wisdom forged in the fire of experience. You are welcome on the show anytime. We really appreciate you and Liberty Council. People can go online at lc.org if they want to support Liberty. We'll be back shortly to talk about our conversation with Matt Staver. Take care, Matt, and God bless. Thank you. Good to be with you. Welcome back to Stand. We just had a fascinating conversation with Matt Staver, the president and founder of Liberty Council. 
Nikki, I want to jump back into a case that Matt was talking about with us, this Supreme Court case he argued called Shirtliff versus Boston. So he was describing how Shirtliff put forward a petition to get permission to fly a flag that he said was a Christian flag on Constitution Day over City Hall. And Boston said no. And despite losing at all the lower courts, Matt Staver and Liberty Council won nine to zero at the Supreme Court, which was a huge victory for the freedom of religion. What I think was super interesting about this case is a couple things. First, and Matt didn't talk about this, both the Biden administration and the ACLU sided with the Liberty Council in supporting Shirtliff in his uh, desire to fly this flag. So it's interesting how constitutional rights can bring together unlikely political alliances uh, when it comes to just a simple reading of the plain Bill of Rights. You've got the Biden administration and ACLU and Matt Staver all going to court together saying that the city of Boston was wrong. I thought that was interesting. Another thing I thought was interesting is when they actually won at the Supreme Court and they got to go back to Boston and fly this flag with the permission of the city, it ended up being a huge turnout. So hundreds of people came, tons of media coverage, and <laughs> if they just let him fly the flag originally, no one would have even known it was a Christian flag. It just would have been a nondescript flag flying with other flags over Boston City Hall. But because they made such an issue out of it, and it goes to years of court cases and battles culminating in this Supreme Court case, this one little tiny nondescript flag draws so much attention and national media ending up having a much bigger effect and message for Jesus Christ than ever could have been accomplished originally. And I think that goes to what Matt was saying earlier in his interview when he said, you know, sometimes what the enemy would intend for harm, God intends for good. And so you feel like you're losing, losing, losing. But in fact, it's this back door to some huge win. Yeah, no, that's great. And the enemy, of course, you're talking about is the enemy of our souls. And I, I find it really encouraging, as, as you mentioned, to see that kind of unity, especially during these divisive times, because yeah. it reminds us that whatever is going on in the larger arc of history, we're all in this together. Mm. And the Constitution was intended to be a document that bound us together mm, under shared values and principles and timeless truths that we chose as a nation to live by, protect, and uh, respect. I. I think you see that unity not just in the ACLU and the Biden administration support. You also see that unity in the Supreme Court decision, right? Where all right. the justices, yeah, nine agree. to zero, nine to zero, right? So it's it's a hopeful reminder to us all that we can come together. I mean, even the the case he was mentioning where where PETA, you know, was on their side, sure, right? right? That again you're seeing people coming together who have these shared convictions. And I think it's important for our audience to understand, and we tried to make, I think, this clear in, the, in our interview with Matt, and he communicated this as well, is that these cases aren't just about Liberty Council's clients. Right. They're about all of us. The standing to protect the right to fly that flag wasn't just about, oh, let's protect Christianity, right, the, the free exercise of religion for Christianity. It's about all faiths, right. no faith. All freedom. All, right. Mm -hmm. And so I think those are the, because when these cases often get spun by the media or groups who oppose, you know, or are on the other side of the issue, they'll often try to spin it as, well, this is just trying to advance this particular special interest. But that's not what these cases are about. Right. So I think it's a beautiful irony, but it's an irony nonetheless, where you have people like Liberty Council who are actually, in a real way, fighting for the very people who 
are opposing them yeah, in some of these cases. So um, do you mind if I pivot to something else I, I, I noticed in the- I'm fascinated okay. about what you're saying. <laughs> I know, my, I'm, so, I'm such a fascinating person. That's why you married me. That, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the stuff that M Matt talked about in terms of, first of all, love, that they don't have hatred towards those who disagree with them, I thought was so important in this, again, these turbulent and intense times that we don't get so angry and bitter with people who disagree with us ideologically, politically, mm -hmm. that we dehumanize them and we begin, because that's what hatred does. It dehumanizes the person that it's directed to. Uh, so I thought that was a very important reminder on his part to say, no, we we choose to love. And I think uh, that's critical. And of course, seeing Biden's administration, right, and the ACLs, you step up and PETA on this other case is also a reminder that the people that we often say are, we, we often talk in absolutes right now and extremes in our in our dialogue today. And these kind of cases remind us that nobody is absolutely X or absolutely Y, right? That there are places where we can all um, come together. If I can just share something from uh, history, because we were talking about American history. Mm -hmm. Daniel Webster was a uh, secretary of state twice. He was one of the most prominent attorneys in our country in the 1800s. He argued approximately 200 cases, 200 cases before the United States Supreme Court. I think he's the second most prolific Supreme Court litigator in our nation's history. Anyway, listen to what Webster said. I just want to pull this up here. He said, hold on to the constitution of your country and the government established under it. Hold on. In other words, Webster was warning us that our constitution and our country can be lost, mm -hmm. which is why it's so important to have organizations like Liberty Council and even like the ACLU, who we may not always agree with on everything, but there are some things that we do agree with them on from right. a litigation standpoint. We need these organizations who are standing up uh, to protect our constitutional liberties. While we might disagree sometimes on what you know the interpretation of the Constitution might be, the heart to protect our constitutional liberties is what's important. Close with this, and I'd like to get your reaction to this. He goes on to say, Webster does, Quote, we live under the only government that ever existed, which was formed by the deliberate consultations of the people. The people formed the government, government by the people, we the people, for the people, right? He said, miracles do not cluster. That which has happened but once in 6,000 years cannot mm -hmm. be expected to happen often. Such a government, once destroyed, would have a void to be filled, perhaps for centuries, with evolution and tumult, riot, and despotism, end quote. So his counsel to his generation of Americans and to our generation is not to take our constitutional republic for granted. Because if we lose it, he says that tyranny and violence are sure. going to follow, and it'll be very difficult to restore what we once had. So that's why I think it's so important that we stay on our toes about protecting our, our constitutional rights. What do, you, what do you think about? I think that goes to what we were asking Matt about. How do you interpret current events and the light of historical events and to what you're saying from Webster, we don't see great empires followed by great empires, right? right? And I hear a lot of people today saying, let's just burn it all down or blow it all up and start over. But then when you ask with what, they don't have a good answer. And I think Matt hit on that a little bit when we were asking him, how do you persevere or how do you take these attacks? And his answer was, I, I know who I am. So it goes back to identity and values. You can't prescribe values and identity for a nation if you can't prescribe them for yourself or for your small group or your family or your community or your city. You get the idea. Um, I think we have to start with who before we can trickle down to what. It's kind of the basic of a strategic plan. The Constitution is a large identity document. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what we're feeling now in the shifting of the country is an identity scramble. Right. We're tearing down those statues and those monuments and shredding those documents or largely rewriting them in the classroom. 
And so we lose that mooring. I mean, you know that several of our children, their classrooms aren't even teaching the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. That the pledge isn't to a national government or a, a deep state. The pledge is to each other. That we pledge allegiance to this symbol that says we've got each other's backs. Mm -hmm. And so then who are we and what are we? And to the, your point, if we don't stand for the Constitution, if we don't stand for our country, what are our military members fighting for? Um, what are they signing up to put their lives on the line for? And their families, what's that sacrifice for? These are the enduring questions that are being, I think, provoked right now when we're starting to pull on the threads of national identity. And it gets back to what are you standing for? Knowing who you are, what your values are, uh, why you're getting up every morning and doing what you're doing enables you to persevere and stand and make decisions like I will serve my country or I will get into this fight. Um, I don't think it's wise to say we're just going to blow it up and start over. I think to you, what I think you're saying, it's better to try and work within the system to change it. Yeah, and work with each other because exactly. we're all in this together. And to your point, you were talking about empires. You know, the Roman Empire never came back. Right. The Napoleonic Empire never Ottomans, came back. Ottomans Persians. never came back. Shaka Zulu's Empire in South Africa never <laughs> came back. Right. So we really have to take seriously mm. uh, these attacks, to your point, on our national identity, which is expressed through the Constitution. So we yeah. all need to stand together and stand for our constitutional liberties. Yeah. And friends, that's a wrap for us. For more episodes of Stand that will inspire and empower you, subscribe to At The Stand Show on YouTube. Follow us on social media under Kelly for Alaska. And you can learn more on our website, thestandshow.org. Until next time, stand firm and stand strong, everyone. And remember, often our victory is simply in the standing. We'll see you next time.